Hello, my name is Leanne Lamb, and I'm Executive Director of Contemporary Asian Theatre Scene. One of our primary programs is the Silicon Valley Asian Pacific Film Festival. And here we're looking at the emerging films, films that we really should be looking at this, this holiday and, um, and onward. I have today, I'm so honored to have Brian Yang, actor, producer, and uh, many films, as well as been on, on TV. He is, um, if you've seen Hawaii Five-0, you've likely seen him um, play a major character, as well as Disney Little Princesses, Saving Face, uh, Man with Iron Fist, and People I've Slept With. I think I've seen all those films and absolutely love them all. Um, Brian, welcome to our program. Well, thank you for having me, Leanne, and you're a true student of the game if you've seen those 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 films. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's there. There, there. Um, I was really excited to have that all connected together, and the fact that you produced as well as um, part of oh, produced such a legendary film called Insanity uh, with Evan Leong, and you know that was just like a gangbuster that really hit the charts. And I commend you for your foresight in following um, Jeremy Lin early on. So. Well, you know, I, I, this this forum will definitely appreciate uh, sort of the the genesis of that story because it was very much, very very much a Bay Area, uh, even Silicon Valley um, sort of, you know, four hundred eight six five zero story uh, we, because Jeremy, as you guys know, was from. Um, sorry for the little technical disruption there. Uh, Jeremy was from Palo Alto and he uh, went to he went to school, played basketball here, obviously locally. And when I first came on his story or came to know his story, it was thanks to the San Jose Mercury News. I opened up the paper one one day when I was back home visiting my parents where I'm sitting right now. Uh, and uh, like during a holiday or some sort of uh, break, like at the time I was living in New York, I opened up the paper as I've been doing since I was a kid. Front page, San Jose Mercury sports section, Jeremy Lin, boys basketball player of the year. I was like, who the heck is this? Because I went to Monta Vista High School down, you know, here in Cupertino and loved basketball and played it when I was in high school, much earlier than Jeremy Lin. But the idea of this Asian American being the top player of the year in in basketball was like mind blowing and i had to had to had to like basically you know find out more about who this guy was and start tracking him and and so that's that's how i came to know him much like a lot of people in this area i'm sure uh, obviously when he went on to harvard and and the nba the world got to know him more but i i like to think the people in the bay who were in the know were like the early jeremy lynn adopters i guess <laughs> oh, that's really exciting. And I'm so glad you opened that Mercury News <laughs> to find that article. And now uh, you're a producer of this fabulous film that just came out in October called Snakehead. And I personally love it. I love the, the characters that you've developed. And can you give us a little overview on the film? Yeah. So Snakehead is a crime drama uh, where our lead character, Sister C., is a uh, is an immigrant who is who comes in uh, through the snakehead trade, which is uh, for those who don't know, basically a snakehead is a person who uh, smuggles human beings into a cross border for a fee. So not unlike a coyote who brings in people across the border from from the southern border into the U.S., snakeheads who are who are uh, very prevalent in the '80s and '90s were uh, working. The, the the trade routes from uh, predominantly from southern China, Hong Kong, out of the ports, and getting people overseas into America, where they could come and pursue the American dream, as everyone wanted to do back then. And um, in our story, Sister C uh, comes here not for the the sort of the typical, you know, uh, pursuit of this dream, but rather to reconnect with a, a family member that she has given up without giving away too much of the film. And so, uh, but in that process, she of course 
uh, is introduced into the sort of the, the underbelly of New York City Chinatown. And uh, in her quest to obtain her objective, she uh, goes all in in terms of doing what it takes to rise the ranks of this um, of the snakehead world and becoming a snakehead herself, because she is not as most people who come in through this through this um, underbelly you know route surrender to or just are content with is getting to America and working sort of menial jobs inside of restaurants, laundromats, massage parlors, the, the rest of it. But she is way too uh, ambitious, hungry, driven um, than the typical immigrant to, to just do those things. So she winds up, you know, again, um, becoming a snakehead herself in the process uh, in an accelerated fashion. And so so the story is really a it's a it's a we like to think of it as sort of a, the next chapter or, or a new chapter in sort of the American um, American crime family story, um, a la, you know, your 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 godfathers, if I may. I know that's a very a lofty uh, comp, <laughs> but but uh, that's what our distributor, Samuel Goldman, actually, they were the ones who sort of uh put that label on us and we were like oh that's interesting never we never even thought of it that way but we kind of like that and so yeah so that's that's snakehead in a nutshell and um i made it with my uh, longtime collaborative partner who i also did lynn sanity with evan evan jackson leong who is actually also a bay area byproduct um although he grew up in san francisco so you know those guys up the street are they're they're uh <laughs> You know, they're different than us 408 folks, <laughs> uh, Silicon Valley folks. <laughs> That's great. It seems like this was a real passion project for you and, and, and Evan. I, mean, I think it took, was it 14 years to really put this together? And I was wondering what really drew you to this film and what kept you going? Yeah, well, Evan's been living with it a lot longer than me because he came across a story, uh, you know, these are based on true events when he uh, read a book uh, that was, that, that wrote, you know, that was um, told a story about the, the woman who was, who was in New York City, her name was Sister Ping, who, who was infamously, you know, brought to justice, but had wound up smuggling in over the years, thousands of people and made uh, millions of dollars in the process of doing this and used that as sort of the inspiration behind this story in the mid 2000s like late maybe or before the before 2010 certainly before linsanity linsanity is when i met evan we were living in new york city we were introduced by a mutual friend our producing partner named chris chen and he was you know we just had lunch one day and he was telling me about snakehead and how that was his passion project but there was right in front of us at that moment there was this kid named jeremy lynn who was doing really interesting things on the hardwood and so we we decided to put our focus into that. So at that point, he had already probably been living with it for, you know, developing the script and just kind of moving to New York uh, to immerse himself in the community. He actually was living in LA where he uh, went to school and after finishing school, wound up working for Justin Lin. And then after doing that for a while, decided I want to go make Snakehead in New York. So I've got to go out there and embed myself in the community meet people, you know, just, just be a student of this world, right. In this, of this, of this environment. And so that's where I met him. So he'd already been doing that for a few years. And then we decided to make Linsanity together, which took us out of commission. Well, took him out of commission from making Snakehead from 2011 to about 13. So about two years uh, and change because making it going through the festival route around the world, and so 2014, by the time Snakehead, or sorry, Linsanity was all kind of said and done, we decided to, you know, hunker down. I said, we had a really great experience working with him. Let's do this. You know, the, I, I want to continue our relationship. So 14 is when we started to um, try to put all the pieces together for, the, for, the, for Snakehead. He already had the script. All his research was done. So by the time I met him, it was just time to go, or so we thought. The first thing we did coming out of uh, coming off the heels of of Linsanity was 
we got a we got a pretty interesting cast commitment, and that was Lucy Liu. You know, Evan had some interest around him after the documentary. He was signed to a big Hollywood talent management company. Lucy was, you know, looking for an interesting story to be a part of. And, and when this came across her desk, it was just like one of those, you know, the, the stars and moons were aligned or so we thought. And so 14, we got our commitment and we thought, great, we can use this to go and fundraise. Obviously, we have an interesting talent member. Um, the story was generating interest, you know, the crime drama genre is very interesting if you talk to the right sales agents and distributors. And so we had a pre-sales agent who was starting to actually sell um, rights to our movie with Lucy Liu attached, even before we shot a frame. That's how this business works. They were going to these film markets. And so 14, 15, basically up to 16. So for two years, we were out there fundraising, trying to do pre-sales and we, raised a fraction of what our goal was and you know after two years of doing this we were you know kind of sheepishly went back to lucy and said look we're so sorry we, we you know we, we can keep trying to fundraise or you know if you don't want to wait around for us we understand you know and we 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 were so sorry but i guess you know it's up to you if you want to continue with us or not. And so she wound up um, graciously bowing out, very amicable. Uh, she's, you know, in fact, she was like, look, if you guys need any help, just don't hesitate to ask. Uh, she, you know, she's been around the block. She knows how this game works. And so we decided to um, pivot and we wound up going out there and, you uh, you know, raising fam family and friends round of, of very, you know, more, much more reasonable amount of money, did a Kickstarter campaign, scraped together all the change we could, you know, find under the couch and basically wound up making this movie for a fraction of what we had set it at. And, uh, and that was, it was, it was not easy. It was definitely, um, you know, a, a, a reality check, a humbling experience in terms of thinking, you know, just because you made this movie called Insanity, it was going to like be really easy from there on out. And that was far from the case. And so uh, we finally started lensing it in. I remember December 2016 was our first frame shot, but that was like we just kind of get did that as a warm up and then we really got into it in 17 uh, after the new year. And so. 17 it took us through i would say the majority of that year we wound up because of the nature of of how we produce this movie which is not something i would ever recommend to anyone watching this we did not shoot it in a in a very um orthodox fashion where you where you shoot it in a in a contained period of time where it's like three solid weeks right we we shot it was 40 over 40 production days spread across a year and roughly a year. And so because we would what we would because of our limited budget, we would have to call in a lot of favors. Uh, we had huge set pieces. We decided we were going to try to pull off everything that was written on the page, even though we didn't have the money. And and uh, we thought, OK, I, I know money can buy you a lot of things, but so does passion and relationships. And so let's put this to the test. We didn't compromise. I don't think we compromised a thing. I mean, other than like having good meals and and like uh, comfortable living quarters, you know, for people we had to put up. <laughs> so, so that's where you can't hire someone of Lucy's caliber, right? You have to hire cast friends or people who are perhaps, you know, a little hungrier in terms of like, wanting to, to do it for the work over the pay. And so, um, yeah, and so we, we basically just, you know, we put on our hard hats and, and we went to work and we, we, we shot this movie in, I think we went to five different cities. We had hundreds of extras in certain scenes. We had, you know, again, the set pieces, everything ranged from a large cargo ship to a 
Chinatown banquet hall where you could have like a wedding scene to having FBI agents and uh, to having a, a, a middle of the desert, like, you know, car chase to um, jumping into the ocean and having the, the Coast Guard chase you, like all these things where you're like, you watch that kind of movie, and you're like, oh, that must have been like a few million, millions at least, or something of that nature. And, and you know, it was not even close. Uh, so I, I don't know how we pulled it off looking back, but I think, you know, I think it was just one of those things where, I mean, I had been become so close to Evan. We just had such a good shorthand and working relationship and understanding and wanting to achieve this vision for him and putting this story on the big screen, it was like we decided we would not stop at anything, at anything. And, and, uh, and you know, it was, I think it was just one of those things where my whole life I've been like, you know, dedicated pretty much my whole life to, to putting on, you know, putting stories of people from our community onto the big screen hopefully into the mainstream. And this was such a compelling story, such a nuanced, complex, you know, character and, and uh, family of, of um, people that, you know, that she lived in that we, we just felt like it was our responsibility once we had committed to telling the story and getting it out there. And literally, you know, that's what drove us. Uh, we, we, we couldn't stop as crazy as it was. And so, so that's, you know, that's what drove us and that's why we wanted to do it. Um, I think it was just also a bit, bit of just delusion and being stubborn, you know, <laughs> and, and refusing to like kind of give, give up because we had gone so far, but, uh, but that was, yeah, that was, that was what, what was, uh, you know, the daily, the, the, the daily, I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, force that fed us. So Wow. <clears throat> well, I had no idea that it would, it took so much. I, I, I've listened to a lot of interviews that you've been part of, and I heard that you're someone that you, who will not, will not accept no for an answer. <laughs> so you must have had, um, your diligence and perseverance were definitely successful and in, in, in all that. And I love hearing the, the, um, the extenuating, uh, I guess the achievement that you that you reached in doing that. So congratulations, <laughs> fabulous film. It's. I'm wondering, you know, what you hope audiences will take away from from watching this film. So, our hope is, you know, obviously we didn't create like a very uh, warm and fuzzy, you know, sort of like. Uh, perfect model minority, you know, character uh, within our community, right? Or, or family or environment. But the important thing, and this was a lesson that Evan learned very early on from working on Better Luck Tomorrow with Justin Lin, uh, was that it, the importance of telling, you know, stories about characters and people in our community that are three-dimensional, that are complex, that are flawed, that are, you know, perhaps the anti-hero, right? Because those are the most interesting characters and the most interesting stories oftentimes. Um, you know, there's, I, I, I know that, it, that it's important to tell positive, create positive portrayals of our community and not always stereotype us and, and, and that, you know, there's, there's danger in that, um, in, in continuing to contribute to that, that idea or notion on screen that we're other or that we're sinister or we're, where we know martial arts or we're gangsters, this and that. But I think if it's handled in the right way, I think if it's, 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 you have to watch it in the context of the film that, you know, there's, we, we should be putting out all kinds of characters. We're not all A plus, you know, highly successful, like, you know, uh, citizens who cooperate with the law in this country. I mean, there's, there's, we are, we are, there's good, there's bad, there's in between, right? And then I think, I think you know, if I'm referencing in terms of that Better Luck Tomorrow story, uh, the screening, I don't know if you remember this, you are a student of the game, whereby uh, at Sundance in 20, 2003, where uh, some gentleman after a screening 
uh, stood up and, and said, you know, I find it something to the effect of like, how can you look at, you know, sleep at night and with the fact that you're putting up like portrayals of these sort of characters in, 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 from your community in this, in a movie, right? Um, and of course, in that film, it was these, these students in high school who had a cheating, like created this whole ring of crime and cheating and then wind up killing someone, you know, based on true events in Southern California. And Roger Ebert, right? The late Roger Ebert stood up and, and was the one who actually put his foot down and said, you know, I, I find it offensive that you asked that question or, or made that comment because, you know, it's, it's not the, like the filmmaker has made a decision to tell a story about a world and, a, you know, characters that, well, number one, not only based on true events, but like, you know, that are complex and flawed and, 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 you know, but there's like, there's intelligence and, and heart behind telling, you know, stories around these characters. And so like, you know, like you would never say this if it was like, if these characters were white, right. Or, or of another ethnicity where you see like stories of crime around that, like it's, is it, is it, Justin's responsibility to only put on stories about Asians that are just like high achieving SAT scoring, you know, like uh, Asian people like so and, and everyone like raved, you know, went went nuts when Roger Ebert answered the question in that fashion. And I actually think it helped the movie uh, generate some more buzz coming out of Sundance because there was this big like brouhaha coming out of the, the that particular screening on uh, the word on the street anyways and so anyway so that's what i hope uh people will will take away is that like you know we're we 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 definitely often have gotten the short end of the stick when it comes to like hollywood portrayals of our community uh, it's getting better you know like little by little but it the i the, what it what it boils down to is this idea of narrative plenitude and that's a term i borrowed from the pulitzer prize winning author Viet Thanh win who who in my interpretation of that phrase is that, you know, we as a community want to put stories out and, you know, we personally, Evan and I with this story are interested in contributing to the landscape of American stories uh, about Asian Americans who are, who are everything, right? Who are, who are good, bad, ugly in between. We can't be afraid to I, you know, examine the underbelly of Chinatown, because if we do, the problem with that is like traditionally it's been examined by by people from outside of the community, who's just sort of had this very one dimensional lens. You know, every time you go, you visit a, or you 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 watch like a season of SVU or some sort of crime procedural, there's a Chinatown episode, and then they'll have snakeheads and gangsters and triad members, and then, you know they're very stereotypical, right? They, they, there's no heart. You see just the surface of it all. And so, so we wanted to obviously go much deeper into that because these people are real, right? We can't, it's not like they don't exist, right? Like, so obviously you walk across any Chinatown in, in, in the world, you know, and, and especially in New York City, there are stories inside of, you know, every, tong every association every you know in every restaurant every nook and cranny of of chinatown and and that was you know evan did the research and in, in finding a lot of those stories and i think that's that's basically what we wanted to bring to screen and and uh hopefully we we achieve that excellent explanation on that one um brian i think the the characters that you developed were surprisingly strong and it, it just it just changes your perception of um the, the strength that comes from within and it, you're able to to um, convey that magnificently through some real badass women so yeah. thank you so much really appreciate that yeah i think it's a, it's really interesting i i love seeing your home i love seeing your family behind you Love seeing your your, your um, elements there. You know, you're you're a Cupertino guy, and I'm wondering, um, as a, an actor producer um, on, on many levels, how does your background 
affect who you are right now? Yeah. So, you know, I guess when I think back on growing up here in Cupertino, and it's it's funny how we're doing this interview while I'm here because I don't live here anymore usually. What I can there there are a couple of things that that I can um, I can think of in terms of why growing up here actually drove me into into the pursuit of the arts and storytelling. Uh, one was the predominant one I'll say is actually I've I'm not really a rebel or sort of like this person who stirs the pot just because or whatever, generally speaking. But I remember growing up here thinking, man, everyone here works in, you know, technology, right? Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley is at the time I growing up, you had Apple, IBM, you know, and it, it just felt like I was immersed, like every, you know, if you didn't go into that field, you, you were, you were an outcast or something. Right. And so I went to school up the street at UC Berkeley. So I was still very much like all the way through college plugged into the Bay area, uh, watching friends go off to work in this industry, you know, and, and I just remember thinking, I don't want to do that. Like, I just don't want to be another person who punches in, you know, at, whatever software company or whatever it is down the street here where it could be so easy. And I, nothing against it. Again, I pretty much all my high school friends are in this industry or, or, you know, related to it somehow. Um, And so I was, you know, I was just sort of driven by this idea of finding a, a different calling outside of this, not just this industry, but also this, this, uh, the Bay area right? I always figured I wouldn't stay here because I don't know, my family's here and I'm always going to be connected to it and I love it dearly. Um, but I was, I, I always had this interest in going out and exploring other parts of the world, you know? And so I, I lived in New York for 12 years. I spent lots of times over a lot of time overseas working in this industry. Uh, and then I wound up just, you know, settling on LA and calling it the base. Cause that it's like the, the death star it draws you back in somehow i'm not crazy about living in la a lot a lot of times but but it is you know it is convenient so um yeah so i i think that was that was a little bit or a lot of the inspiration was like i just wanted to do something different that wasn't like uh i was always interested in writing and journalism and like doing create like music and sports and art in general so like i i just had this you know was it the left side of my brain, I guess, or right? I'm always forgetting like which side of the, that brain was much more pronounced or, or I was plugged into. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I, I remember I did journalism in high school. I was like an editor on the newspaper staff. I went to Berkeley where, which is not known for, for obviously for creative arts or, or theater, but I, I took a lot of theater classes. That's where I got immersed into it. And uh, yeah. And so, so I, I think it was just this idea of like being another like second generation Asian American guy from the Bay Area who winds up going to do blank just didn't feel very interesting or like my life's calling. And so, so, so I was really, you know, when I saw, I remember always growing up, like thinking we're so underrepresented on screen, right? Watching watching your classic sitcoms and movies, like, like every, any other American kid growing up. And when I got to Berkeley and this, this, uh, the, the consciousness, this awakening of being Asian American was further drawn out of me because I took Asian American studies and you're surrounded by, you know, so many Asian Americans who, and that you, you learn what, you know, double ASA and CSA and, you know, all the Asian American clubs are, and you're like, oh, wow, like, this is, okay, this is interesting. Oh, yeah, that's how, how I, you too, like that, you know, and so, um, so that was a, that was a real period of my life of growth, and like, you know, uh, also coinciding with, uh, I remember this so vividly that, you know, it's, it's called CAM today, as you know, your, your, your cohorts up the road, back in the day, in my age, 
they started off as the it was called the it was something yeah. else nada yeah nada right nada and i remember sitting in a screening of of yellow you know speaking of uh was that direct i'm like who did who direct that was that justin or, or quentin but I, I remember watching shopping for fanes and yellow these two movies feature films that came out around the same time at that festival and, and just being like oh my gosh like this is this is this is what I want to work in. This is what I've always longed to do. And who are these people? Like, what is this world? And so, um, yeah. So it was it was again like kind of growing up not wanting to be a Bay Area byproduct uh, and looking for something else, and then like finding that sort of in in college. Uh, and then the other the other thing that happened in high school that was like a little bit of a, I guess, of a token sort of like you know, reason why I got nudged into this field was because my mother, who, <laughs> whose house I'm in right now, she actually dropped my, my photo and a, and a little application form into this, this uh, open casting call box to a Macy's uh, back to school fashion show event. And so it was at the Valco, Valco Fashion Mall, which no longer exists completely raised i just drove by it the other day i was like wow they really it's there's nothing it's just a big fence with a bunch of weeds now um and i got selected by that uh somehow and i wound up that year like doing a bunch of little like uh, local ads for them and and then we, we even like did fashion shows like runway fashion shows we around at, at the macy's around the bay area and then culminating in one big event in at Fort Mason in San Francisco. And that event, actually, after that event, um, a lot of agents came up to came up to us, people, who, you know, us kids, because it was back to school uh, thing was from like, literally from like, toddler to high school. And I was, I was in the high school category. And these agents from San Francisco who were at the show, came up to us and like, gave us their business cards and said, Hey, if you're interested in continuing in this industry, and so I wound up, um, I remember calling one of them and I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm kind of hooked. Like, what is this all about? And they introduced me to the world of commercials and, you know, auditioning and, and uh, you know, there's not a lot of work in San Francisco, but every once in a while there'd be like a film or, or, or show that, that shoots in San Francisco. And so that, yeah, so that was what um, got me a little more hooked into the business from that side of things. And that's why I took theater at Cal. I, I was like, oh, I want to, I want to, I want to explore this a little bit more. So I, I took an, a, you know, acting class. And then I remember even after I graduated UC Berkeley, um, I really wanted to move to LA and just pursue this industry full on. But my parents were very against the idea. And I, I moved home because I was basically just buying time to figure out what to do with myself. Uh, and I, I actually enrolled at Foothill College, where I took a, I, I took a, a one year theater conservatory uh, uh, class or like program. So mm -hmm. it was it was like a five day, five, five days a week, nine to five, you know, full on like theater, everything from like learning, you know, your voice to makeup stage combat like you know all 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 the bells and whistles like something that i never thought i would do but i i did that i did a bunch of like small plays when i was there so like i think that just like again my bay area upbringing was was very much like this is where it all began and and it was driven by the, the need to do something else but also then like coinciding with this awakening of my being asian american in this world and how how I could how I could help like um, help tell stories either on camera or behind the camera that would again like be positive, be be complex, be be fully formed, right? Um, not just positive, I, 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 but more interesting is 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 probably what I should say uh, in terms of uh, in terms of these stories, and so that's the genesis. And that's, you know, that's, I guess I, I attribute that to actually being a, a product of this place called Silicon Valley. Excellent. <laughs> One thing I'm, I'm wondering about is what's your comment on what's happening with um, more of a 
a wokeness of Asian American um, in in film and in media right now? Yeah, I think it's really like in my lifetime, the, the, the first time where it's seemed to genuinely become this, um, this, this uh, conscious and, you know, like proactive search and, and, and um, approval of our stories in, in, in Hollywood, right? Um, because growing up again, in an era of Joy Luck Club, which, by the way, I was an extra for in in college because they shot most of that movie in the Bay Area, including on the UC Berkeley campus. And that was the first time I stepped foot on a major motion picture. I was just a lowly extra, but I, it, it, I saw the whole, you know, with my own eyes, I was like, wow, this set is impressive. Like, what are these people doing? Like these people <laughs> pulling cables there, like these people, you know, Russell Wong, like going into his trailer, like, what is he doing in there? Like that just continued to pull me into this world. And so, but when that movie came out and it was such a success, we thought, oh, maybe there'll be more Asian, you know, storylines that are, that are coming through Hollywood's, you know, studios and whatnot. And just like, nothing right after all american girl came and went and then i think it wasn't all the way till like and I, better luck tomorrow and saving face which i had the good fortune of being a part of you know obviously great films made a lot of noise in their corners right going to toronto sundance and the rest of it um but i just don't think like again it, it they created a ripple but it wasn't this huge wave right and we hoped it was the wave, but it was really just like, again, our community was excited and, and, you know, like hoping like it would open up the doors more. But I think after each of those examples, again, it just went back to like, oh, it was just like a one-off thing that, you know, these things trickle out over time, but there's really no movement, you know, no, 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 no wave building. And so it wasn't until 2018, I really think, like, I think, you know, social media, I think, uh, I think technology, obviously, uh, and I think the rise of even the Far East on many levels, right, out of Korea, um, China for a minute, I, that's a whole nother ball of wax with what's going on over there, but like, and also the audience's mainstream's, you know, tastes, right, in terms of like, we see that um, there's this appreciation now for, for other stories, right? Because maybe it's a little bit of like being bored of watching the same old thing that Hollywood has been producing, right? Uh, but I'd like to think it's just like, we're, we're finally getting the opportunities, right? The chances to be seen and, and demonstrating how strong our storytelling you know, can be. Right by filmmakers from our community, from from even overseas, from the motherland, right? Parasite winning the Oscar, um, but but just even back home, like Crazy Rich Asians, obviously demonstrated at the highest level that you could make money from telling stories about you know Asian using Asian American talent with English speaking Asians, you know, and then from there, I, I really think I look at CRA as sort of that 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 moment, right? That, that, um, the film that really, I'm not going to say it's a floodgate because it's like, it's still like, a, you know, it's never going to be just a free for all, but it definitely pried the doors open a little bit wider and people are kicking the, you know, the doors down now with the opportunity. So since then, you know, you've had just a plethora of movies, right. That have just, have have received mainstream support uh studio support and been you know lauded for you know their 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 you know again the the, the just the the performances and the great you know the great storytelling uh that they, that they do so i think it's i think this was always there it's just that what's happened in the last five to ten years 
is that the opportunities have been given finally by the folks in the you know the ivory tower and that was due to you know again these things like movements started on social media uh because you can put a hashtag together you can create a movement and they can't ignore that because because the pressure put on people or put on the powers that be through what's happening on Twitter and, 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 and whatever's happening online, it just travels, right? Like travels like at the speed of sound, right? And, and there's danger in that, but there's good with it too. The power that, that this can, that social media has, mm -hmm. that the galvanizing of community online has, has, has been able to like do, right? And so, um, so it's, it's exciting. Um, it's interesting. I think it's, there's, there's um, you know, the dust hasn't settled. I don't think that, I don't think that like people go, oh, is this, is this like a phase that's going to end? And then, you know, like the doors are going to shut again. Like, I don't think that's going to happen because it's, it's a bit of the genie out of the bottle effect where, what are you going to do? Like, oh, we're going to suddenly not talk to any Asian American, you know, storytellers and green light any projects because you had your moment and we only gave you five years now. Like it doesn't work that way, right? Now that now that we've created these voices, these, these, you know, these visible examples of success and, and people have seen how talented, you know, Asian American comedians can be, how they can be romantic leads, they can be, you know, all of the above and not just like martial artists or or other, you know. I don't think that's going to go away. And as this country continues to become moved towards the direction of being a majority minority country, you know, I think it's just, again, we're just, uh, we're just starting to like scratch the surface in many ways. And, uh, you know, and I know I sound like a, an old, like grizzled, maybe bitter veteran. Who's like these kids these days don't even know how, how easy they have it, but it's true. Like, and I have to pay, you know, respects to my forefathers and, and mothers in terms of like people in this industry who laid the, the tracks and haven't been able to like necessarily reap the benefits of that because of their being ahead of their time. Right. And, 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 and uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's encouraging to see. I'm glad to see it. Obviously now that I have kids, like, I think it's um, you know, you're always doing it. What, what drives you? Why do you do this? Right. And I, I, I think being a parent, you know, the answer becomes very obvious. And so I, I want to leave the world a better place than I found it. And specifically, you know, my kids hopefully will benefit from, from all the work that, you know, we do, um, particularly in this field, because, because the power of media is so pervasive, you know, whether people know it or not, or, or appreciate it or not, like, how are, how do people learn about other people, other communities? you know, about history, it's through film and TV and storytelling, right? It's, I mean, yes, books and, and the rest of it too, but like visual medium is very much a part of that. And, uh, and so it's our responsibility to keep telling great stories. And, and thankfully today, again, your, your streaming platforms, your executives who are waking up to it are starting to be like, okay, wow, now we see, we get it, you know, a little bit more. There's still a huge education process, but we see that the importance of telling stories, we see that it sells, we see there's talent, um, we, you know, we see you. And so, uh, so we just got to keep on pressing, keep on putting out great stories and keep uplifting each other. And, and it's, you know, again, it's, it's obviously through organizations like your own that are holding, you know, putting these stories up, bringing communities together, you know, uh, the organizations like Cinevision in New York City, which has been around for over four decades, you know, like Asian American film festivals have been around a long time. People just may not necessarily know it, you know, unless you're, unless you're of the community and really plugged in. Um, but this idea that, oh, this all just happened like overnight. It's like cool to be Asian and like, see, we have all these movies that are super successful on screen. It hasn't always been the case and there have been people who have been you know trying to do this for a long long time uh lots of movies that i think people people don't even have never even heard of that are equal if not 
more deserving of being getting the accolades and success that movies today are getting, but just because they, they came along at a different time, unfortunately, you know, they may not have been able to reap those benefits, but their work was no less important because it, it's built up to this moment and we all stand on the shoulders of the people before us. And so, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm always aware of that, you know, e each and every day or each and every project I work on. So, so it's good. It's good. We're having this conversation now and seeing what's happening out there. Uh, and I, I just hope it continues to, you know, flourish. Thank you, Brian. I, I'm wondering, thank you for sharing your history on this one. If you had some advice to give folks who want, who want to move, pursue the um, artist ground in, in acting and, and producing, what would your recommendation be? Wow. Uh, I would say that, you know, there's an old adage, which I was told many times before, and I'm sure, you know, will be told till the end of time. And that's where um, opportunity, let me see if I get this straight. It's uh, you, the effect is basically that you, you, you know, you need you need to be prepared in order to succeed and make your way in this industry, right? You need, you need to have preparation and, that meets some luck, right? And you can't control the luck, right? But the preparation obviously is something you can't. And so I tell this all the time to, to those who, you know, seek advice or ask me as they're starting out, like, you know, what can I do? What, what, where, what should I be doing in order uh, to, to set myself up for success? And the, the basics are obviously honing your craft, right? You, if you're going to go be a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever trade that you choose to do with your life, filmmaking, acting is no different. You know, people have this idea that it's some sort of mystical, magical field where you just like walk to, you know, you get a talent agent and like, boom, you're like, oh, it's like, it's like that. Or, or I'll just like uh, open up my computer and start writing a script, you know, and then someone's going to buy it and we'll turn it into a big movie. Like, no, it like you, you spend 10 years in medical school and residency, learning to specialize to become a doctor or whatever you, you know, whatever, whatever specialist you become. It's the same thing, right? You, you don't necessarily have to go to school, right? In terms of this field, but you better get into some kind of class or some sort of, you know, forum where you're learning, right? And, and for a lot of people that's going to, you know, get their MFA or BFA for filmmaking, for theater, whatever. But if it's not spending, and I get it, an expensive, uh, you know, a lot of money for, for a degree, it's real life experience of going to in getting into class, acting class, a theater conservatory, right? Getting the basics, getting reps, learning how to fall before you can fly, right? And so, you know, the acting industry is just a lot of it is about rejection. You get, you know, turned down, you know, way more often than not in terms of when you try out for an odd, you know, a role. But every audition you do is is another you know, step forward, even if it feels like it's not necessarily because the more comfortable you get in the audition room, the more comfortable you get with performing, you know, so, so if you're just starting out doing that on the smallest levels in a scene class, scene study class, doing local theater, doing a small film, a short film with, you know, with students, um, independent productions that may not necessarily pay you money, you know, whatever it is to build up your real your your body of work your experience it's the same thing it might take you 10 years before you land your first series regular or or major supporting role in a motion picture that's that's unfortunately how it works like and again if you ask the the doctor cousin or the you know the lawyer you know um mother-in-law like how did you get to where you got like it you know yes of course there might be like a lightning strikes and you're like you're you're discovered on an elevator or whatever by a talent agent and like 
you know, at the tender age of 21, you're like, this is so easy, but like, come on. All right. If that happens to you, great. Like ignore everything I just said, but by and large. Um, and then, you know, again, filmmaking is no different. Like you, you, you got to go out there and make short films. You've got to go and seek out a community of people to work with, to learn from. If you're not going to go, go to school, right? I mean, even if you go to school, you got to do that stuff, but, but that's the basic, that's the foundation you build. And it, and a lot of, a lot of that is, is also, you know, the, there's this word, uh, you know, or phrase who, you know, which is so true also in this business where, um, in film, especially as a filmmaker, uh, when you are starting out, obviously you're not going to like just start off as the director on a, on a big feature film. You're going to work your way up. Uh, maybe you start off as a PA, you become someone's um, line producer, assistant director, you know, you, you just work your way up, right? And then the more directors you work with, people who are before you, because they've been around longer or whatever that like they will then you know if you're if you put out good energy I always feel like you know it's one of those things that comes back to you in spades as well that's just kind of a basic thing be a good person uh you're gonna you know get a call one day and be like look uh I need would you be interested in working on this project? And it's going to be like a step up. And then, so, you know, you're going to climb the ladder just like, again, in any other field and profession. Now that's the foundational stuff you can control. And for the most part, put yourself into like this, onto this path of like, again, moving upwards. The luck of it all is the part that, I mean, I'm still waiting for. It's like, you know, the, the, element that it you know takes you from here to there where it's like oh you went from making a small indie film that played a bunch of festivals to suddenly you're like wow you got handed the keys to uh do a marvel movie that's that's pretty amazing you know chloe Zhao, <laughs> you know uh kathy yan right uh who went from dead pigs to birds of prey so like that part is just like, wow, how did you do that? Well, I, there's no secret recipe to that. That's honestly the good fortune of, again, the movie gods, right place, right time, who you know, that kind of stuff. And so, but I think in order to get that, to have that luck happen to you, you have to be prepared, right? If opportunity comes, but you're not prepared, it's going to go away and, and, and opportunity may not knock twice. And so, so being prepared is all you can do and all you can control. And so you got to do the best you can with that. And that, and again, that means actually going to school. If that means finding a community to practice is not the right word, but you know, like hone your craft again, um, then you can do that that's within your control, right? And you have, there's a community of filmmakers and actors right under your nose, even in the Bay Area. You know, I've seen the message boards, I've seen the, the Facebook groups, uh, wherever you live, you know, obviously some places are, 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 are probably a little better than others, but even in the Bay Area, you have people now who are starting to uh, try to discover more about this industry and want to congregate with people like-minded people and so plug plug in plug into them go to the film festivals you know you meet like-minded people at these things right uh and 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 the world of opportunities open up from there you you you, you exchange you know contact info you go through lots of coffees and you know you know drinks with people no doubt that that oftentimes don't go anywhere, but every once in a while it does. And so, you know, so that's, that's important too, just not being, not living in your, 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 you know, I know we're on COVID, but in normal times and, or if doing it safely, you can, you can go out and congregate and, 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 um, you know, and find your tribe, so to speak. So, so yeah, so I think uh, there's a lot of things you can do and, that are in your control. And, uh, and then, you know, obviously the, you gotta be, have that like basic uh, commitment too. Like if you think it's, 
going to happen overnight. If you think it's going to happen in two years, uh, look, Snakehead took us collectively 14 years to make, right? Now, obviously, we were making other things along the way. It's not like it was just like, oh, that's all we're doing for 14 years. Um, but that's just kind of how this business is. You have to learn how to juggle, multitask, and, you know, and, 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 and be committed for the long haul. So that's, uh, that's what I would tell a, a, a person just starting out, you know, it's not for the weird, it's not for the weak, <laughs> it's not for the, you know, uh, uh, folks who are just dipping their toe in it, like, it's, it's, it's a commitment, it's a lifelong commitment, it's a choice, and um, it may, you, you know, again, it, there's a lot of bumps and bruises and twists and turns, but, but uh, if this is what you want to do, like, you know, and you have no other um, no other thing that you can imagine yourself doing, you know, get cracking. <laughs> That's one of the best explanations I've heard, Brian. Thank you so much. That, that was a very thorough, thorough, um, approach of, of life. It's like, if it's nothing else you want to do, that's it. Commit yeah. and move forward. Excellent. Just to bring it back to Snakehead. Um, I want to make sure people see this film. It's fabulous. Where can they see this now? So as of this day, this very moment, you can catch Snakehead on uh, Amazon or iTunes um, through the, the transactional method of renting or buying. Uh, so, so, you know, hop onto one of those streamers. There are other, it, it's, I think it's on like a multitude of them, but there's those are the two biggest, most common, commonly trafficked ones. Uh, in the near future, I have no idea myself when it will be. So I, I don't want to misspeak, but but I know it's coming down the pike. The, the movie will uh, be turning up on a major streaming platform. So, you know, follow us on social. If you just can't part with the uh, eight bucks <laughs> right now um, and you'd rather wait, and then, you know, if, if you follow at Snakehead Movie, you'll know, uh, you know, as soon as we know uh, when and where you can watch the movie just on your on your favorite um, SVOD platform. So, yeah, so that's um, that's where you can find it as of December 27th, though. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Brian, thank you so much for your time and just sharing your richness and your history. Um, I think we, we all have a better appreciation for the film and for all those incredible um, actors that move into the, the whole world and move the Asian American um, foot forward in, in, in people's minds and hearts. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you, Leanne.